Z H A double Y double N. How the hell are you supposed to pronounce that? For that and 10 wildlife photography tips coming up right after this. If this is your first time to my channel, welcome. My name is Shane James. I'm a wildlife photographer from India. And uh, yeah, so Z H A W Y W N is how my name is spelled, but it's pronounced Shane. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's move on to wildlife photography. I've brought this down to 10 wildlife photography tips for this vlog. But there are a whole lot more uh, ideas and tips and suggestions, but for the purpose of this video, we're looking at 10 of them. So let's get into it. The most common question that is asked is, where do I start? Start in your own backyard. Start in your local parks. So there's a lot of wildlife around that's been urbanized, but essentially they're still wildlife. They're habituated to people. So they're not as likely to be skittish and to run away or to fly away. That's where you're going to build the basis of your relationship with your camera because ultimately your camera is just a tool and you need to know how to get the most out of it so it's about training yourself to be able to use your camera in in the way uh, that you need to to capture moving subjects to capture action quickly to change uh, your settings in different conditions this is something that is kind of one of the basic tenets of wildlife photography but something that a lot of people don't seem to follow. In the early hours of the morning is when animals are most active. That's when they're just coming out of a night's sleep. Uh, birds are active, they're looking around to feed. Animals are possibly hunting or they've just hunted the previous night. Uh, so there's a lot of interaction going on. So get up early. You have to get up. If you're going to uh, lie in bed and think about your breakfast in the lodge, in the camp in the morning, chances are you're gonna be missing out on some beautiful light. So you should get out early and stay out late. So if you look at these examples that we have right here, the light is not just golden light, it's soft light. It's, it's creating these beautiful highlights, but it's also very, very early in the morning, which is why you have that low angle. You have those beautiful, soft, warm tones. Now the same kind of light happens when you look in the evening. Uh, this line beautifully backlit, the sun's just behind the trees coming down and beautifully lights the grass, so the, the grass is completely lit up and it's this suffused sort of glow, staying out late. Why? The opportunities for a sunset. This is not something that you're going to get if you decide, listen, that's it, I've had enough, I'm going to go back, I want my drink, I want my shower. Then you're going to miss out on some amazing opportunities. And remember that silhouettes only happen early morning or late in the evening. The tone in the sky this is, this is what it was like, because this was after sunset, and it made for this great image. But this wouldn't have happened half an hour earlier. It's about getting out early, staying out late, to get the best sort of images. Before you head out, test your gear. This is extremely important for a couple of reasons. When you take a shot, you realize there was no memory cards, no, your, your battery is not charged, or there could be a bug. Maybe you, you need to reset your camera, maybe you need to format your cards. Well, in this case, uh, if you look at this image, this was uh, taken in Kana National Park in India. So this was in the evening. We had a sort of um, a cultural interaction with the local tribe who were performing uh, a traditional dance for us. And so I wanted to make some slow shutter images to get some motion blur. So I'd set it up on the tripod and took some images. But the problem was the next morning, when I wanted to take a photograph. And the first thing when we entered the park in the morning was a leopard on the side of the road and was just crossing the road. It was a perfect opportunity. And this was the image I got, pure white. Why? Because I didn't check my camera settings. I didn't reset everything after I had taken the long exposure image of the dancers the previous night at the lodge. So when I picked up my camera in the morning, I was still on a two second timer and I was on a long exposure. So I clicked, nothing happened. Two seconds later, the, the shutter opens. 
and then it's open for about three seconds or, or whatever time I had set it for. So all I got was pure white and then the leopards crossed the road and it's gone. It was my one opportunity and I blew it. It was purely because I didn't test my gear. Had I tested my gear when I got into the safari jeep and I was sitting at the gate uh, before we could enter the park, I had all the time in the world and I didn't do that. Expensive mistake, but lesson learned. Your settings should match your intent. As in this case, I wanted to freeze the image of birds in flight. These were my settings. So I was an aperture priority. I had a fast shutter speed and I was able to freeze the action. So all of these birds taking off from the marsh but what I actually intended to do first was slow shutter pan. So my settings had to reflect that. And this is the image that I made just as they left the ground. So for this, I had to shoot in shutter priority. So my settings had to reflect my intent. So when you visualize that I want to do this, know what settings you need to keep in order to make that happen. This is another example in the early morning light. The light was nice, but it was an opportunity for me to do something else that I wanted to do. And when this line moved a little further into the thicket, it was an opportunity for me to make this image. So this was a rimlet image because the light was coming from behind. I drastically underexposed so that the background, the shadows, everything went completely dark. And it was only the really high lit areas that popped up. If I didn't change my settings, from the first image, I would have got the same kind of effect. So whatever I did in post-processing, I was never going to get this effect. Your settings should match your intent. Composition is your first and basic artistic expression. So if you don't compose your image well, if you place your subject in the wrong part of the photograph, it's never going to resonate. One of the things that you've that we always talk about in wildlife photography is the rule of thirds. Now, while it's called the rule of thirds, I think it should be more the guidelines of thirds or suggestion of thirds. Um, so in this case, I've got the black box, the subject, on the bottom one third of my image and not in the middle. Uh, my horizon line is down to the bottom one third again. So the idea is that you leave a lot of space where your subject is looking. Uh, so it gives that sort of intent that the animal is going to move into that space or looking into that space. So the same thing works with birds. These are twitchy little birds. So they all tend to look left, right. I decided to leave space to the left because there was another bird on the left and these birds kept turning and looking at it. So I had to wait for the right moment, leaving space. And then the moment that they all turned and looked, I nailed the shot. The composition in this is important because it tells you a story that they're looking at something that's not in the frame. So remember that your image isn't only about what's captured in your frame. It should also sometimes talk about what's happening outside the frame. That's the interest that your image should pull. So these four birds, what are they looking at? What makes four birds look in the same direction at the same time? I just spoke about the rule of thirds, and this is why I said it should not be a rule of thirds. So this was a pair of elephants and, and they were kind of mock fighting in Jutu in Tanzania. So do you position them to the left? Do you position them to the right? In this case, because they were kind of equal contestants, there was no puff of dust to the left or to the right. I decided to keep them right in the middle because there was so much drama happening with uh, the landscape with the clouds. It was like two gladiators in a gladiatorial arena fighting. Everything in the image kind of was drawing your attention in to those two elephants. So I didn't want to move them left or right. So this was one of those few cases where I broke the rule and said, no, I'm going to put them smack bang in the middle. Clean backgrounds. People tend to pick up the cameras and start firing straight away, not caring about the background. Given the opportunity, try to move around. Try to get the cleanest background that you can. If you have a cluttered background, that's always going to detract and distract from your subject, which you spent a lot of time trying to capture. This image that I had shot in Balpara, India, was a fantastic opportunity because they both looked at me, but that background completely ruined the image. And I had to wait till they got the right kind of a background. And this was that opportunity. It was this beautiful lush green backdrop. There was no distraction, clean background. 
Another example, this image of um, a river turn. We were in a boat, and so this bird is sitting on a rock in the middle of the river. The bird may be beautiful, but the background is completely distracting. As we moved around the rock, the bird also moved. And more importantly, the background changed. And now I had this beautiful clean background, and I got it in this beautiful light. So the importance of not just taking a shot because you've seen the subject and then move on to something else. Try to look for a better shot with a better background. Showcase context. Filling the frame is good, but not in all aspects. Sometimes you need to tell the story of the context. This is an image of a critically endangered great adjutant stock with a cow's tail in its mouth. How did the stock get a cow's tail? I mean, what's the story there? So while this image can, you know, is a beautiful portrait, it showcases the animal, uh, and there's obviously the question, there's, there's some interest there. It doesn't tell the larger story. And I switched to my 7200, and then I captured this image. Now this is the image that tells the story because it's standing on a garbage dump. So it's a very sad story, but the fact is that you need to tell the story. You need to showcase the habitat to show, uh, you know, what are the conditions that this bird that was once plentiful is now living under. So context is everything. Telling the story using the context by switching to a wide angle is much more important. This was in Tanzania last year, and we followed this line that had walked across the savanna. Here, I could have shot this image uh, with my 500mm on my D5 and I would have got this beautiful portrait. But it wouldn't tell the story of the fact that it's climbed a kopi. What is a kopi? Everything that is about this moment is captured in this image because you could see the first thing that you look at is how did he even get up there? You know, and wow, look at the scale of that animal. A lion is a big animal, but in the scale of the kopis, the context, it, it tells you so much more than just what a 500mm zoomed in portrait would have, would have conveyed. Would have been a nice image, but it wouldn't have told the story. Pick up your telephoto lens. Use your wide angle lens. So don't always pick up the biggest lens that you've got. For some reason, a lot of people seem to think that eye level means on the ground. No, that's only if your subject is close to ground level. If your subject is up on a tree, you're not going to shoot from the ground. So shoot at eye level of your subject. Because there's nothing that connects us more with an image than connecting with the eyes. I shot this image of an imperial eagle with Fairly good background because it's clean, it's just a clean background. And while it's an okay image, it's not as engaging because I shot this sitting in the Jeep and then I shot this from the front, just from under the bonnet. And this is the image. It's a completely different perspective because now I'm not just at eye level, I'm actually slightly below. And it lends so much more gravitas. This is Jairam's bush frog. And while it's an okay image because I timed it well, it had just expanded its vocal sac and as it called, I made the image. But if I wanted to, to bring the viewer into the frog's world, I had to change my perspective. Because now I'm way up here and the frog's down there. But the moment I bring myself to the frog's eye level, it completely changes the whole thing. Now you can see the texture on the vocal sac. You can see the texture in the eyes. You can see the, the underbelly of the frog as well. So this is a far more engaging uh, image than the previous image. And it was purely because we're shooting at eye level. Another image of a leopard. She was looking straight at me when I made this image. And while it's a nice image because of the eye contact and you, know, you can see the raindrops, it doesn't engage because you can see that she's lower. I'm in a vehicle, I'm shooting down. Now this is, fast forward one year later in 2015, this is another leopard that's not the same leopard. Knowing that she was on a particular heading because we were watching her for about a, uh, for about a minute or so, we parked in a trough. So automatically that brought us bang at eye level with her as she walked. Beautiful background, 
because this was on the edge of the river, so there were a lot of trees in the background, and it perfectly framed the shot. But it's so much more engaging than the previous image because of the eye level. Know your subject, or at least try to know your subject. The spider of lions had made a kill, and this cub had fed, and it was moving from the kill towards where another lioness was. Now, because I knew that lions are social creatures, tend to greet each other by nuzzling, so I was ready for the act. So I took this shot here. Immediately, I then moved to the lioness. She was static, and the cub is going to come and greet her. So I had to compose with the lioness in mind and not track the cub, because that was where the cub was headed anyway. But because I had composed and I was ready, and I was hoping that this is what it was going to happen, I was able to make this image because this cub, it didn't stop. It actually just nuzzled her on the way and just kept going. If I didn't know that lions nuzzle when they meet, I would have completely missed this beautiful tender moment. This was in 2016. We had this pair of mating lions and with lions, uh, as with most big cats, they mate. It's very brief. It's just for like what 10-15 seconds and then they rest for about 10 minutes or 15 minutes and then the female would initiate mating again. And so this would happen several times. So I knew what was gonna happen in terms of mating, but what was interesting with this lion and lioness was that every time at the end of the mating, when he bites her on the neck, she would turn and snarl at him and he would always throw himself back to escape her jaws. So having noticed that, I had composed this as a portrait because I knew the lion would rear up. Right enough at the end, she turned around and snarled at him and he, jump back with his mane flying, you know, the, and fangs bared, and this was the outcome. So know your subject. It can make all the difference to making a, a good image or a great image or capturing a moment that will last for just a fraction of a second. My last tip is probably something that I should have said first, but having showed all of this, um, is be patient. This is wildlife photography. With wildlife, there is no set time, there's no set agenda, nothing is under your control. You are completely dependent on the animal's behavior. Wildlife is all about patience. If you are not patient, you're not going to get the image. So there are times when uh, we sit in our vehicles for two hours or three hours waiting. And that's nothing because there are actual wildlife photographers out there who camp out in certain positions for days to make images, to make one image, because that's how rare that particular animal is or that particular moment is. Sometimes in India, it's about waiting for alarm calls. So there's a big difference between India and Africa. In East Africa and Tanzania, in Kenya, it's very visual. You see the animal and you go to it or you get a call on the radio sometimes. But generally, you see the animal because it's open grassland, it's open savanna. But in India, because it's forests and you're driving through the forest, you're dependent on auditory cues. So you're listening for alarm calls. So you would hear a cheetah, a spotted deer alarm call or a sambar alarm call. And then you kind of extrapolate, okay, it came from this direction. So we take this road, we go there, and then you wait. At the end of the day, you have to wait. You have to respect the wildlife. You have to be patient. You can't make things happen. They will sleep when they want. They will eat when they want. They will hunt when they want. Everything is when they want. All you have to do is keep your camera on and ready and wait. So these are my 10 wildlife photography tips. Bonus tip, always shoot in RAW. RAW means that you're keeping all of the data intact. This is how it was explained to me and, and, I, and I love the explanation. This is like ingredients in a recipe. Imagine if you, a JPEG is like using only ingredients to make a dish. And every time you want to edit it, you're going to lose information you're going, because you've used up all your ingredients. A raw image is like keeping your ingredients and making any number of dishes with the same number of ingredients and it doesn't affect the number of ingredients. So that's what shooting and raw does. I hope you guys enjoyed my 10 tips on wildlife photography. Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe and hit that bell icon. I'm looking forward to hearing from, back from you guys. And until the next video, see you.